The hydropower that's being sought to solve New England's energy needs comes from massive dams hundreds of miles north in Quebec. They're a point of pride for some and a point of suffering for others. We here in Quebec, the little French Canadians who were building those huge dams. Everything was lost without any kind of compensation. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankosky. We'll explore what happens on the other end of that big power line. We'll also look into a law aimed at fair and impartial policing and what it means for immigrants in Vermont. The law enforcement agents that are working on Vermont tax dollars are helping to deport uh, our, our immigrant neighbors. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. We'll visit Newtown, Connecticut, as it honors the life of a young girl killed in the school shooting there with a new place of kindness. And we'll hear the tale of a man who was nearly lost at sea, but later became a hero. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is Next. I'm John Dankosky. We've been covering the way that local police, federal border officials, and immigrant communities interact in the area south of the border between Quebec and New England. U.S. Border Patrol, as we've learned, has a jurisdiction that extends 100 miles into Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire. But now the ACLU of New Hampshire is challenging some checkpoints set up by the agency on I-93 over the summer. The group says that those stops violated the state's constitution, as NHPR's Todd Bookman reports. During multi-day checkpoints in August and then again in September, Border Patrol agents stop cars near the town of Woodstock, which is about 75 miles south of the Canadian border. Along with the detention of more than two dozen undocumented immigrants, Border Patrol and local law enforcement also made arrests for drug charges. But Gilles Bissonnette, legal director for the ACLU, says those stops and the use of drug-sniffing dogs violated the state constitution because there was no warrant or reasonable suspicion. So we just think this is incredibly problematic and it hardly uh, is consistent with New Hampshire's live free or die approach to these issues. The ACLU has filed a motion in district court on behalf of 18 legal residents who face drug charges following the checkpoints. A hearing on the matter is scheduled for January. That's Todd Bookman reporting. Now, when a local sheriff in northern Vermont pulled over two Mexican farm workers last August for a traffic violation, he immediately called for Border Patrol. The two farm workers will soon be deported, and immigrant rights advocates say more detentions and deportations are likely under a new Vermont policy that governs the cooperation between state and federal law enforcement. Fueling this debate is body cam video of this August traffic stop, as John Dillon of VPR reports. What do blue lights mean? It means pull over and stop. Just have a seat in your vehicle. Have a seat in your vehicle. Go inside, sir, please. Stay put. Stay put. Stay in the vehicle. The two farm workers in a green Dodge pickup were driving home when they were pulled over by a county sheriff's officer who noticed the truck had passenger car plates, not the truck plates required in Vermont. The stop was captured on body cam video. The men don't speak English, and a woman on the scene interprets. And he don't have driving license. 13. No license? No, and he don't have that. Is that a Romeo unit? Back up, please. Just, he had that title. 11, 13, about two and a half miles from Boston Post. 10-4. Still send a Romeo unit, please. Central. The officer asked for a Romeo unit, referring to a federal Border Patrol station in nearby Richford. Soon, the Border Patrol arrives on the scene, and a federal agent named Steve asks to question the two farm workers. You uh, good with me talking to him, or...? Sure. Do you want do you want his uh, ID first, or I'm just gonna ask him what he is? These okay. guys say they're permanent residents. So okay. I doubt it, but okay. The, the other guy does he have ID? Do you know? Or? The local officer starts to write up a traffic ticket, and then he lets the feds take over. Well, after I give him this ticket, I'm I'm done with him. Unless you guys want me to stick around, I want to stick around for a little bit, help you out. Okay. Fine. Thanks, man. Um, on the video, the federal agent can be heard referring to some of the immigrants as wet, an apparent reference to the pejorative slur, wet back. Did he say that she's, she's not sure if, 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 oh, he's she's, not sure if she's, if she's, uh, she's wet? For Will Lambeck of the advocacy group Migrant Justice, 
What happened that August evening is deeply disturbing. The two men, a father and son, were taken into federal custody. Lambeck says they will soon be deported. The law enforcement agents that are working on Vermont tax dollars are helping to deport uh, our our immigrant neighbors. It, It doesn't make any sense at all. Lambeck is concerned that revisions to the state's fair and impartial policing policy will make it more likely that local police will share a person's immigration status with federal authorities. He and other advocates were pushing for a stringent prohibition on this kind of cooperation, but the final version of the policy allows sharing of information on immigration status. This opens up the door to the sort of activity that we saw in Franklin County in August. There is no difference in terms of protections. We are not interested in having there be losses of protection. Major Ingrid Jonas is Support Services Commander at the Vermont State Police and leads the agency's work on fair and impartial policing. She strongly disagrees with Lambeck's interpretation of the policy. She says she's only now become aware of the video of the traffic stop. She says the incident needs to be investigated, but her initial impression is the stop does not square with standards of fair and impartial policing. In the previous policy, that would have been completely improper. So I don't see where that example is a good example of anything that wouldn't have been covered in basic proper policing practices 101. Jonas points out that anything the state issues cannot conflict with federal law which says the state cannot ban cooperation on immigration. But the new state policy also says local police should have, quote, no obligation to share immigration status unless it's needed to protect public safety. And Jonas says victims of crime need to trust local police and that Vermont cops have no intention of serving as an enforcement arm for federal immigration officials. That's Vermont Public Radio's John Dillon reporting. Steve Zind contributed to that story. This week marks five years since the shooting at the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Catherine Violet Hubbard was one of the 20 children killed, along with six educators. Her family spent the last three years planning an animal sanctuary in her memory. WSHU's Davis Donovan visited the land of Newtown that will serve as the grounds for this sanctuary. I visited at the end of November for an annual event they call the Settling In. It's when the sanctuary invites locals to come by and help the deer, rabbits, birds, and other wild animals on the land get ready for winter. Days like today really remind us of the opportunities and and obligations that we have to care for the animals that we share the earth with. Jenny Hubbard is Catherine's mom, and she oversees the sanctuary. Dozens of families and children are here. They're on hayrides, building bird feeders, and exploring a kid-sized replica of a nest rabbits use to keep warm in the winter. Kids can run around and, and just be kids. We, we just love it. The meadows are all hayed. It's, it's a special day. One of the most popular attractions is a pumpkin catapult. Kids line up to drop in a pumpkin and watch it launch off into a nearby field. Three, two, one. Big ball. Pull, 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 Jack. The pumpkins that, that people have for Thanksgiving don't need to go to the dump. They don't need to go into garbage cans. They can actually go into our meadows, and they help feed the animals over winter. This land once belonged to the state of Connecticut, which gave it to the Hubbard Family Foundation in 2014. A local animal rescue center had a suggestion for them. Use the land to build an animal sanctuary. We weren't real sure what that meant. And when they described it as a place where children will be able to look into the eyes of of animals and see their innate beauty, we knew it was exactly what Catherine would want. Catherine was in love with animals from the moment she got her first rescue dog. She would tell us that she was going to start an animal rescue. Um, She made business cards in kindergarten um, and and told us that she was going to care for all of the animals. Jenny Hubbard says Catherine didn't discriminate. If you asked her what her favorite animal was, she'd say, all the animals. She would catch 
insects or or butterflies and she would send them off with a a question of asking them if they would go tell their friends that she was kind and her thought was that if the animals knew that they were safe that she was kind that they would come back in in droves they would bring their friends back and not surprisingly they always always did those words tell your friends that i am kind they've been adopted as a kind of slogan and they greet visitors to the sanctuary land hubbard has thought a lot about what the past five years have meant to her More than anything, she says they've been a lesson in kindness. That's what she sees in the support from people in Newtown and around the world who've donated time or money or care to help the families who lost someone on December 14th, 2012. The compassion and the kindness that was given to us over the past five years um, is so important in a world that's, that's hurting and in a world that's just bombarded with messages of tragedy and, and despair. Hubbard says the best way for those who want to remember Catherine and the others who lost their lives that day is to spread that kindness, whether it's to people or animals. Putting a bird feeder outside or bringing milk bones to, a, to an animal rescue or just being nice to someone at lunch. Um, we felt like we can give forward the kindness and, and compassion and encourage what's been given to us. Hubbard has plans for the sanctuary to offer a shelter, a vet clinic, and a wildlife rehabilitation program. It's taken a while to raise funds, but she hopes they can break ground next year. That's Davis Donovan reporting from WSHU. hydropower from the north, and the complicated history that comes with it. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. Imagine a massive dam cutting a line a mile long across a pine forest 900 miles north of the Canadian border. Then picture yourself coming home and switching the lights on after a long winter day. These two things are increasingly connected. First, there's this vast network of hydroelectric dams owned by Hydro-Quebec. It's the electric company owned by the province. It has powered Quebec for decades and they've got plenty of energy to spare. Hydro-Quebec already supplies about 10% of the power that's used by the grid here in New England. Utilities across our region are competing to build new transmission projects, which could result in New England getting about 17% of its power from Canadian Hydro. The most well-known of these proposals, and one of the most controversial, is the Northern Pass, a hotly debated transmission line that would cut north to south across much of New Hampshire. Part of what's up for debate is whether hydropower can be considered a renewable resource. While damming rivers impacts local ecosystems, carbon emissions from these dams are quite low. Altogether, they actually give off less carbon than solar power. In a region where energy costs are high, Canadian hydro is also appealingly cheap. But north of the border, hydropower has a different story. It's a story of a struggle over economic power, ancestral lands, and cultural pride that cuts pretty deep in Quebec and it's pretty fascinating. Intrepid reporters Sam Evans-Brown and Hannah McCarthy traveled far north to bring that story back to us. They co-host Powerline from the podcast Outside In. It's a series about the history of the state-owned utility Hydro-Quebec. Outside In is a podcast from New Hampshire Public Radio about the outside world and how we use it. Sam and Hannah, welcome to Next. Thanks so much. Thanks. Glad to be here. Before we go all the way north to Canada, let's start, Sam, here in New England. And we've talked about this before in our program, this idea that hydroelectric power from Quebec is a big part of the energy future here in New England. 
a lot of people think, including some of the biggest utilities, that our region needs to make a big deal with Hydro Quebec to bring a lot more energy down from up north. C- can you talk a bit about who's making that argument that projects like Northern Pass are going to be good for New England? Well, you know, it's really it's really a lot of the policymakers at uh, the highest levels of all these state governments, and you hear them making it for different reasons. I mean, uh, Governor Paul LePage in Maine for a very long time has talked about connecting to the the quote unquote cheap hydropower uh, up north. Uh, you know, Vermont is is the one state in New England that has recognized hydropower as uh, actual renewable energy. Uh, and then in Massachusetts, there's this this law that was passed that has driven a procurement of 9.5 ter terawatt hours of electricity uh, as, as a means of lowering their carbon emissions statewide. The, the idea of getting this power from up north, though, is not just going right across the border and having transmission lines from a project that creates energy just north of, of Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine, but you guys went a pretty long way. Can you give us a sense of the distances you traveled to see some of what Hydro-Quebec does? Yeah, absolutely. So I had never been further north north than uh, Montreal. And the first leg of the first trip that we took uh, was a 14-hour drive up along the east coast of Quebec. And it's hard to communicate the scale of things. There's just so much open land. Um, and that second trip that we took was approximately, I would say with coffee breaks, 22 hours <laughs> north. <laughs> And you're going along these it is incredible landscapes and scents are shifting as well. I remember when we were on the Bet Siamet River, the air was so perfumed that I said something to Sam like, it smells like a candle, which <laughs> tells you exactly how experienced I am in the outdoors. But, you know, the projects up north, they reflect the scale up there as well. For example, the Daniel Johnson Dam, which is the Manique 5 Dam, that's a mile across. So it's huge. It's absolutely huge. It's enormous and creating an awful lot of electricity, which we'll talk about. Sam, I just have to ask you, though, we hear an awful lot about the cost of long throw transmission lines through New England, no matter how we're generating, whether it's wind or solar or traditional, say, gas fired plants. It's the building of the infrastructure to get power from one place to another that costs an awful lot of money. How is it, I don't know, cost efficient to build transmission lines that go so far north to bring the electricity down? That is an excellent question, and it, it, it's basically uh, premised on the idea that these lines are going to be used close to their maximum capacity. And and so we mentioned the 9.5 terawatt hour at, uh, figure at the top, and what that represents is you know n- about 95 percent utilization of these lines. And so that's what that's one of the things that actually makes the creation of power lines to connect to say uh, Maine's wind resources much trickier is because. Because uh, a wind farm might be operating at 30% capacity versus versus the 95% you need in order to make these these power lines make financial sense. You mentioned just how massive these dams are. Let's get a little sense here. We've got tour guide Eric Hamill. This is the sound of standing underneath a turbine inside the Central Robert Bourassa, a massive dam complex that is way up in the middle of Quebec. This facility is one of the biggest in the world. Together, its two powerhouses have 22 of these turbines, and they put out more power than six nuclear reactors. So if one of these can power a city, um, then how much does the whole facility, you said it's... Oh, that way, uh, this is the equivalent of, uh, of a town of uh, closely 1.6 million people. A, a town of 1.6 million, that, that's an awful lot of people. How much of Quebec is powered by dams like these? Well, so so Quebec gets uh, 98, 99 percent of its electricity from hydropower. And, and you know, when we talk about electricity in the Northeast, you're thinking about light bulbs and computers and smartphones. But in Quebec, the electricity is so inexpensive that something like 70 percent of the homes actually heat their their space with, with electricity. So, uh, you know, that would be very expensive down here in New England. But because the rates are so low in Quebec, uh, many people have opted to install electric heat, even 
in that very cold climate. So it's it's really a shocking chunk of the province's energy. New England, for instance, on a peak day will require 28 gigawatts of, of power. Uh, Quebec is more like 36 gigawatts, even though there are fewer people in that region. Mm. I think that what you just said maybe gets to the question of why hydropower is something that is so important to Quebec, but maybe something that's not as important as it once was to New England. We just don't have the types of resources that we used to. I mean, right now we're talking about tearing down old dams that haven't been in use for 100 years instead of building new ones, but they just keep building and keep generating hydropower up there. 3% 3% of the world's fresh water is in the Quebec province. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, they see this as their, their sort of um, their patrimony. That's something there to, to take advantage of to, to further the wealth of the province. And let's talk through that, that history. Hydro-Quebec is an electric company, but it's also something that's a bit bigger than that. Hydro-Quebec is part of the government of Quebec, and it's uniquely tied to the culture there in a way that you explore in this series that we don't really understand. I mean, we don't tend to have a positive relationship with our utility companies, but people in Quebec really love Hydro-Quebec. Tell us a bit about what you've learned. Yeah, so before the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s in Quebec, French Canadians, although they were the majority in Quebec, were kind of this economic underclass. So utility companies were really dominated by Anglican and American Canadian people. So with the establishment of the Parti Québécois and the nationalization of hydropower in the province, what you had happening was this massive power shift where suddenly French Canadians were in charge of their own massive utility. And it also meant that they were creating tons of jobs for these French Canadians to go work on these job sites where, you know, say they'd worked at a hydropower facility before, they would be working at a facility where they're language wasn't spoken. Now you had, you know, French being spoken at all of these job sites. I, I want to play a piece of tape of, from one of your stories uh, with the political science professor. His name is Daniel Saleh. He's from Concordia University in Montreal talking a bit about how the province came to own this uh, electric utility. When I was a kid in the 1960s, uh, they were building uh, the Manicouagan Dam. I can remember that it was something really to be proud of. Because we here in Quebec, the little French Canadians who were, you know, just a generation before, were hardly able to amount to anything economically. We were building those huge dams. Mm. And you mentioned this a little bit, Hannah, but it really comes through in your reporting in your series that the everyday French Canadian when you ask them about Hydro-Quebec, there's, there's a real sense of pride, and, and we can't discount that. that. That's a real feeling that people in that province have. Yeah, it's a feeling today, too, and I think it was clear as we were doing some research into the history of Quebec, when you see the way that Quebecois people were once thought of in the province, to be able to have this utility that brought them into you know, enfranchisement of a sort. It is something that continues to be something that, you know, generation after generation is taught to think of as this source of great pride in the province. And then there's this this tension that you that you uncover. And it's a tension that honestly, Sam, those of us on the receiving end of this power don't think about at all. It's that this isn't necessarily a uh, a resource that people who speak French uh, claim for their own, this is a source that's been shared for hundreds and hundreds of years with Native peoples. Before we play some tape, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you started to delve into that relationship and that tension between um, Quebec and the Native people of the region. What what we found is that as I started to reach out to Native groups, you know, um, the, there's an overarching body that, that represents sort of all Native people in Quebec. I was funneled to the Pessimit. So, so the Pessimit hosted the first uh, mega project that Hydro-Quebec built, the Manic-Utard mega project. Um, and as we'll sort of delve into... 
it in a lot of ways shows this sort of sharp divide between the way things used to be done in the province of Quebec and the way things were done today. Mm. Let's actually listen to, this is uh, Edgar Sanange. He's uh, an elder from the, the Pessimist band of, of the Innu people. Uh, the Pessimist live on the north shore of St. Lawrence in the summertime, but in the winter, they travel of hundreds of miles up these rivers to hunt and trap. Let's Let's listen. Everything has, has been drowned. They lost uh, all their gears. Their camps were, were flooded. Uh, the, their equipment for to hunting equipment, trapping equipment was flooded. Their canoes, uh, the, the nets to, to, to fish for, for, for living, for the living of their family. Everything was lost without any kind of compensation. Hmm. Sam, what more can you tell us about this history? It, it sounds as though this this was a, a group of people who were taken by surprise uh, by this enormous building project. Yeah, we, we spoke to a room full of elders of the pessimist community, and, and basically what they say is that they were never notified in any way that these projects were going to be built. And so they, they found them by uh, sort of heading upstream in the fall and coming across the construction sites uh, in the midst of their, of their trip up into their winter hunting and trapping territories. Um, and they were never offered any compensation until until after the projects were built. And then when that compensation deal came, they were offered one hundred and fifty thousand Canadian dollars, uh, which came out to one hundred and sixteen dollars per person in the community um, for all damages past, present and future. And and that that deal is the subject of a lawsuit today, which has been ongoing for uh, nearly 20 years. And have they been active? Have have tribal members been active today in trying to get Northern Pass, this big project that would so benefit Hydro-Quebec and, and send energy our way? Have they been involved in this uh, dispute at all? Yeah, so so they have used the Northern Pass project uh, as as a way to try to gain visibility for for their cause. They've they've tried very hard to make a connection between this uh, the increase in exports to New England and and the uh, the issues that they are working on today in their home territory, uh, which are essentially, you know, salmon habitat on the Betsy Met River, uh, issues resulting in the raising of the reservoir levels on the many Quagon Reservoir. Um, they had they had a great deal of flooding this October, which they also lay at the feet of Hydro-Quebec. And, and every time one of these issues uh, comes up, they issue a press release in which they, they uh, try to link it to the, the increase in exports to New England. So, Hannah, though, you learned that their experience, the pessimist experience, isn't the same type of experience that all of the First Nations groups have had. What did you find out about the way Hydro-Quebec has dealt with with other tribal groups? We also reported on another First Nations group called the Crees, and specifically the James Bay Crees. Um, and so they first entered arguments with Hydro-Quebec while a project was being built on their territory as well. But the difference there is that, you know, this was only two years after the pessimist struck that first sore deal of their own. The difference with the Crees was that they banded together and they brought Hydro-Quebec to court. And over the course of a lot of negotiating, they developed what became this massive 400-page agreement called the uh, James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. And this is just full of provisions for you know, local government and education and social services and future rights to negotiations and also compensation for $135 million. So if you compare that to what happened to the pessimist, the Cree were, in addition to getting about 900 times the compensation for this project, also receiving all sorts of other um, services granted from Hydro-Quebec. And then when they were dissatisfied with the way that Hydro-Quebec implemented that, they launched a whole other series of protests that resulted in another landmark deal, which included a lot of provisions, but also $3.5 billion worth of compensation over 50 years. At least from what they're telling you today, Hydro-Quebec says they're, they're acting as a different type of company than the one that 
took a lot of this land, worked against the interests of some First Nations groups back in the 1960s. You have here Sonia Burgess. She works for Hydro-Quebec way out in the eastern part of the province where they're building the latest mega project. Here she talks a little bit about the work that they're trying to do with tribal communities there. My job is to ensure that the agreement signed by the people uh, of Equinichit um, and uh, the, the hydro objectives are met. They don't put up with any grab from hydro, you know? They, they don't, they don't. And that's okay. They, they, with, with every uh, partnership, you know, you, you, you want something, they want something, and we communicate. Do you guys get the sense that that's actually what's happening on the ground, that the, the tribal groups are able to communicate with Hydro-Quebec and they're really hearing their concerns? I would say in terms of Hydro-Quebec side of things, you know, are they doing more than they've ever done before to communicate with and touch base with these First Nations communities? Yes. Uh, but especially in terms of the pessimist, whether or not these First Nations people are getting what they want from Hydro-Quebec, I think is a little bit of a murkier question because they're so entrenched in all of their past grievances with the company. So even what's done now by Hydro-Quebec can't really make up for what went on in the past or mean that they're going to have this rosy relationship with the company despite company outreach. Mm. I'm wondering, Sam, if you feel as though the arguments that have been raised by by Native peoples in your series and that have been made over decades are are resonating at all with people here in New England who are making decisions about a project like Northern Pass and whether or not we should be taking uh, electricity that's coming from uh, an area that's been in so much dispute. I I don't know. I've talked to you about this before. I think about the place where I grew up in western Pennsylvania and in West Virginia, where an awful lot of open farmland is being fracked for cheap natural gas. And when we expand natural gas here, we often say, well, it's a cheap commodity. But the fact of the matter is, is that something's got to happen on the other end of it. So is, is any of these questions about what's happening on the other end of hydro, is it resonating at all in New Hampshire today? Well, I'd say the answer to that is yes and no. And and uh, where you do see it resonating is with the the opponents to these power lines. They uh, are are very happy to take the messages that that native communities in in Quebec uh, and other provinces supply to them and use them and integrate them into their messaging as part of their continued opposition to these projects. Uh, however, I think what I'm hearing from policymakers is that you know really that. That is a decision to be left to Quebec. Um, you know, they call this uh, siting concerns. You know, if if Quebec wants to build a dam, if they want to say yes to the siting of one of these hydro projects, then that's their decision to make. And it's up to us to decide whether or not we want to connect to that resource once it's built. Um, and it's just sort of a question of, of you know, sovereignty. You know, who who makes who's in charge of decisions where? Um, and I haven't really seen those arguments uh, making making their way into the rhetoric of decision makers. Uh, Sam, I'll ask you a last question, and it's just to maybe give us a sense of what's next with all this. We talk about Northern Pass because that's the big project that's at issue in your home state. But there's a lot of attempts to get this hydropower down to New England. Can you just give us a snapshot of what we might be seeing coming literally down the pike soon? The first decision that's coming will be in January and actually will happen down in the Bay State. And that's when Massachusetts is going to decide which of these power lines it wants to uh, give the the contract for the those 9.5 terawatt hours. And, you know, it's been really interesting in recent days. The project coming out uh, of Maine has uh, been making a pitch for for its its proposal as the least cost of the five that have been proposed. There's also, you know, the project in Vermont has been putting out videos about how the community has accepted the, their proposal and how they already have, you know, backing from the towns in question and the governor and the legislature. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of criteria to consider when evaluating all of these these power lines and just what Massachusetts decides to do will be really interesting to watch. Um, and then in February, at the end of February, we'll have the final uh, state decision on the Northern Pass project, and we'll see whether or not the state siting board is willing to okay it. 
Sam Evans-Brown is host of Outside In. Hannah McCarthy is producer and co-host for this series. Thank you both so much for joining us and for bringing us these stories. I really appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thanks. You can find all four episodes of Outside In's special series, Powerline, along with photos, maps, and videos at outsideinradio.org slash powerline. You can also subscribe to Outside In and to this program, by the way, wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up, an incredible tale of survival at sea. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. Before you could get farmed salmon at every grocery store in America, all of our fish had to be caught in the wild. For thousands of men drawn to Gloucester, Massachusetts to work in the fishing industry, that meant long and dangerous journeys into the North Atlantic. It's still a very dangerous job, but just imagine what it was like more than 100 years ago. Every year, hundreds of fishermen were lost at sea. Howard Blackburn, well, he should have been one of those statistics, but instead he became a hero. Independent producer Matt Fresica has Blackburn's story. Two men in a small boat on a winter morning, somewhere off the coast of Newfoundland. Tom and Howard. They pulled up a fishing net full of halibut, enormous fish, hundreds of pounds each. Tom hauled in the net, and Howard grabbed each fish and clubbed it over the head to kill it. Around them, other men worked in other boats. In the distance, they could see the schooner they had sailed to Newfoundland. The storm came up quickly. The other boats disappeared. Tom and Howard started rowing back to the ship, but they couldn't see it through the snow. Night fell and the snow let up, and they could see a light in the ship's rigging, but the wind and the waves kept pushing them away. We put every ounce we had on the end of the oars. No use. The wind was too strong and the sea too rough. The vessel's light stayed just as far away. They set anchor to wait out the wind. All night, waves filled up the boat as fast as Tom and Howard could bail it. At daylight, we looked for the vessel. There was no vessel. Howard and Tom were both from the Atlantic coast of Canada. Tom from Newfoundland, Howard from Nova Scotia and they had both gone to Gloucester, Massachusetts to join the fishing fleet. Gloucester was the center of the North Atlantic fishing industry, big business, back when the ocean was teeming with fish. And dangerous business. In 1883, the year Tom and Howard lost sight of their ship, 209 fishermen from Gloucester died at sea. Many left families behind. Tom and Howard took turns bailing out the boat and bashing ice off its sides with the bat. Howard took his thick mittens off to get a better grip. The next minute, he looked around for the mittens in the boat. Tom had pitched them over the side in a baler full of water. Tom pointed to Howard's hands. They had turned white. What would happen if they froze up, if we lived through the gale? Tom would have to row ashore alone. 
or if the vessel should chance to come along and pick us up, there would find one man at the oars and the other sitting like a dummy on the thwarts. Howard's hands were freezing solid. Slowly, he wrapped them around the oars, making two frozen claws. There now, I'll be ready to do a dory mate's full share. As the second night fell, Tom stopped bailing. He only said, what's the use, Howard? We can't live till morning, and we might as well go first as last. Howard kept bailing all night. By morning, Tom was dead. The wind had stopped blowing. Howard slid his frozen hands onto the oars and started rowing. He rowed all day and all the next day. By noon on the fourth day after the storm, Howard saw land. Around dark, he spotted a shack on the bank. It was abandoned and full of snow. He spent the night pacing, trying not to fall asleep, eating snow to quench the thirst he had built up over four days on the water. The next day, Howard rode up a river and found a tiny village. This was Little River, Newfoundland. A family took him into their log cabin and dressed his hands. It took days for them to thaw out. And when they did, Howard lost all of his fingers, except a stub of both thumbs. The family shared their food with Howard, but the town of Little River was close to starvation that winter. All they had to eat was flour, cornmeal, and salt cod. Villagers started eating their dogs. Howard's story began to spread outside of Little River. A ship of seal hunters came to see him. They left behind enough food to keep the villagers alive until spring. On April 23rd, four months after he'd gone astray, Howard was bundled up in a sail and carried onto a boat on his way home. Howard made his way back to Gloucester. In his absence, he'd become a celebrity. Those other 209 men lost at sea that year weren't coming back. But Howard was the one who lived. He'd come back from the dead. The owners of the halibut ship he'd sailed on made a point of paying him his share of the earnings. The local newspaper took up a collection they raised $500. People expected this fisherman with no fingers would need the money to live on. Instead, Howard used it to set up a cigar shop. The shop did well. The following Christmas, Howard went into the newspaper office. He wanted to donate $500 to the families of fishermen who died at sea. It became a habit. Every year, Howard would give away extravagant amounts of food and money to folks who needed it. And every year, he'd send a shipment of food to Little River. He opened a tavern and entertained sailors by telling his story and picking up quarters off the bar using the flat of his hand. But something was missing. The story of his great adventure began to grow old. His days as a tavern keeper blended together. Howard wondered if all the significant, exciting things that would happen in his life were in the past. He organized an expedition to the Klondike Gold Rush and sailed around the tip of South America and up to San Francisco. He didn't make it to Alaska. He fell out with the rest of the crew and took the train back to Gloucester. But the trip proved to Howard that he could still sail, even without fingers. Really, the problem had just been other people. That's when Howard's second act started. He decided to sail on his own across the Atlantic Ocean. It had been done before by five different men, 
although never by someone without fingers. He bought a 30-foot sailboat that he named the Great Western and left Gloucester Harbor in June 1899. Almost immediately, the wind died. Howard was stuck in fog. His right foot started to hurt. The pain climbed up his leg. For eight days, he went nowhere, sick with pain, unable to eat. Finally, he decided he had had enough and turned the Great Western back toward land. But the fog was so thick, he was afraid he'd hit rocks. Then, the wind came back. Howard started feeling a bit better. He ate something. The pain subsided. He put up the sails and headed out to the open ocean. One day, a passing steamship hailed Howard and asked if he needed anything. I had not heard the sound of a human voice for about 30 days. My own voice sounded so disagreeable when answering them that I made up my mind that I would never let an hour go by without saying something. So after that, whenever anything had to be done, I would give orders to do so and then go do it myself. On August 18th, 62 days after leaving home, Howard sailed into Gloucester, England. He drew a crowd. News of Howard's attempt to sail across the ocean had preceded him. There were speeches, toasts, a reception at a fancy hotel. Howard visited London and Paris before heading home. He didn't sail back. He booked passage on a Cunard ocean liner instead. And he was ready with stories to regale the newspapermen in Gloucester with when he got back. A couple of years passed. Howard got restless. In June 1901, he headed out again on his own. On the day he left, he held a press conference. A business house sent one of their clerks to me and wanted me to put their advertisement on my sale, promising me to give me adequate compensation. This I took as an insult. I'm not going for money, but for my own enjoyment. Had they given the Addison Gilbert Hospital $100, they could have covered my boat with ads. Howard got beaten back by heavy storms. Days at a time, he sat at the tiller in the gale, unable to take a break to sleep or eat. But when steamers came along and offered to take him aboard, he refused. On July 18th, he reached Portugal. It had taken him just 39 days, the record for a solo Atlantic crossing. At 24, Howard Blackburn managed to survive an unimaginable ordeal through the force of his will. And it had made him a celebrity. It would be perfectly understandable for him to stand behind his bar and retell the story for the rest of his life. But something drove Blackburn back out to sea. Something about that danger. Being alone against the ocean made him feel alive. And he liked having stories written about him in the newspaper when he got back. So, 20 years after coming back from the dead, he went out again and again to face the same ocean that had taken Tom Welch and thousands of others. And again and again, Howard Blackburn came back. That's Matt Frassica from his podcast, The Briny. It's about our connections to the sea. Peter Souza played the voice of Howard Blackburn. Now, Blackburn went on to other adventures. He navigated inland waterways from the Hudson River, down the Mississippi, and around the tip of Florida. He died in 1932, a pretty old man, and crowds lined the streets of Gloucester to watch his funeral procession. You can learn more at thebriny.net. It's T-H-E-B-R-I-N-Y dot net. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrea Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. 
Todd Merrill composed our theme music. If you'd like to hear more of his music, it's at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to the band Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. If you like this week's show, you can consider giving us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. It does help other people find out about Next, so thanks. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with support from the Melville Charitable Trust. And it's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and WNPR.